Today's video is sponsored by MyHeritage, the leading global service for family history research and DNA testing. MyHeritage is the number one family history service in Europe, putting more than 16 billion records with a B right at your fingertips. Whether you're the family historian or know absolutely nothing about your family tree, MyHeritage puts you in the driver's seat to tell the story of you. It's been great having my heritage as a sponsor because I got access to it and I dove into my own family tree and found all sorts of cool stuff. My mother, for example, has a German sounding surname, which I'm not going to tell you because when you phone the bank, they're like, what's your mother's maiden name? Security question. That is for me. You won't trick me that easily, my heritage. Anyway, I traced that line all the way back to the 1850s when my relative first immigrated from Germany. Good old great, 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 great grandpappy Wilhelm. On the other side of the family tree, I found one of my great granddad's records from the RAF. That's the Royal Air Force when he fought in World War One. There's even this photo of him. I know it's small, but it was back in the day of him in some sort of parade. I also found another relative who has five middle names. Possibly the most British thing about me. So look, I had a great time getting into all of this, and I think you will too. There's lots of cool elements that I didn't even mention here, like how my heritage can colorize old family photos. Now, especially if you're here with me in Europe, you'll definitely want to check this out. As I mentioned, billions upon billions of records. Right now, you guys can sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features that my heritage has to offer. And if you decide to continue your subscription, you'll get 50% discount. Just click the link in the description box below to get started. And now today's video. Ah, Zeus and Jupiter just faces the same coin. What about Venus and Aphrodite? When we think of ancient Roman mythology, oftentimes we're really thinking about Greek mythology without knowing it. The line between Rome and Greece is sometimes clear. For example, Roman spoke Latin, Greek spoke Greek, simple and clean. Other times, that line is incredibly blurred. Case in point, Roman religion is something that has been so obscured that without knowing it, many assume Roman and Greek gods are one and the same, just with different names. In addition, we know that Rome expanded well beyond the city's borders into one of the largest empires the world had ever seen. This meant that it encompassed cultures very different from the simple Latin farmers that settled the ancient city. What about the gods of these foreign cultures? How did the various religions so important to their societies mesh together and Rome so seamlessly handle this aspect of such a large and diverse civilization? Right off the bat, the Romans themselves will admit a great religious debt to their neighbors, the Greeks and the Etruscans. The Greeks maintained colonies around the earliest territory of Rome called Magna Graecia in South Italy and Sicily from the 8th century BCE. The Etruscans came from north of Rome in an area called Etruria, and their last cities were absorbed by Rome in 27 BCE. Both societies exerted a great influence on Rome that affected not just what gods the Romans worshipped, but how they worshipped them, including rituals, theology, and even the myths themselves. This is not to say that Romans did not have their own relatively native gods, or that the Roman religion is just a pastiche. While the Roman gods share parallels with the Etruscan and Greek gods such as Jupiter, who functioned even then as Rome's chief god, Rome had its own gods such as the two-faced Janus and Flora, the god of nature. Roman religion was built on a foundation of priestly officers that acted as gatekeepers for what is and isn't Roman religion. By priests, we don't mean professional priests who had only one job. Usually they held officers tied to politics, mercantile business, or served in the military. These officers were organized into colleges such as augurs, who could read signs from the gods, all the way to pontifices who had control over the calendar and could dispense law. Roman religion also had a fixation on rituals, with the belief that incorrectly performed rituals could result in occasional terrible consequences. This opens up the question. If Romans were so obsessed with ritual, wouldn't that make it harder to keep incorporating foreign gods into their own system? The answer is actually no, because the Romans believed in local gods or genius loci, spirits of the place. Every place had a god, and it was important for Romans to identify a place as god and apply worship and rituals. For example, Greek rites were recognized separately from native Roman rites, and the priests even dressed differently for them. Beyond concrete Olympian or early gods in the 3rd century BCE, the Romans also began to worship personifications of abstract concepts. For example, they worshipped a personification of Rome itself called Roma. They also worshipped Concord, Faith, Honor, Hope, and Victory, who we also know by the later Greek name Nike. It's even thought that Venus originally started as a personification before she became associated with the Olympian Aphrodite. This worship of personifications shows how flexible the Roman religion could be. Internal developments were accepted with outside additions as Rome expanded. The colleges always handled the incorporation of foreign gods, and their cults were 
permit it. One college of priests was quite unique. The Board of Fifteen for Ritual Action. Among other things, they had a responsibility unlike any of the other colleges. Consulting the Sibylline Books, a mysterious collection of Greek prophetic poems. Oftentimes, when Rome faced a crisis, the books were turned to to find an answer. It was the job of these priests to consult the Sibylline Book, and sometimes the resulting consultation was the adoption of a foreign god or cult. The most famous of these Sibylline adoptions was during the Second Punic War, when when, after a consultation with the books, a delegation was sent to Pergamon to transfer an image of the Anatolian mother goddess Cybele to Rome. Cybele's cult was associated at first with victory and later with Magna Mater, the mother deity of Rome. There seemed to be no clash between this foreign god and native gods, showing that, as far as we know, Roman adoption of foreign gods had a large measure of acceptance. As the Republic expanded, it incorporated new peoples and locales. In some cases, incorporating new peoples, cults, and gods became easy, such as with the Greeks. Other times, relations were tense, or tense in nuanced ways. Egyptians are a good example of possible tensions that developed as foreign cults came up against Roman religion. Egyptian gods had already made their way into the Hellenic world before Rome incorporated Egypt into its empire. Isis was being worshipped in Rome in the first century BCE in an initiatory mystery cult that was unusual, and was usually in a triad with her husband Osiris and son Horus. A temple was even built for Isis around 43 BCE in the city of Rome. However, even though figures like Isis, Osiris, and Horus were worshipped by Romans in their own cults, this wasn't always evidence of fully peaceful coexistence. For example, Egypt rebelled against Rome in 172 CE on religious grounds, appealing to a Hellenized form of Osiris called the Alexandrian Serapis. There's another example. The Jews suffered under the Romans, most infamously the Roman occupation of Jewish lands and the destruction of the Second Temple. However, while the Jews saw their share of oppression under the Romans, for the most part, they were exempt from taking part in Roman religion in a way that ultimately would not be afforded to later Christians. But the Romans, the Jews, had an ancestral religion, and so they were exempt from emperor worship or worshipping the Roman gods. That said, this did not stop serious persecution. There were flare-ups across Roman history, and Jewish philosophers like Philo and Josephus turned to Hellenic philosophy to write about their own religion. These writings outlived the Roman Empire and played an important part in the development of Christian and Jewish theology, influencing how scholars of those religions talked about a god that was technically one of many gods that Romans worshipped. Arguably a more important religious change associated with Rome going imperial was the worship of the empress. How did a people who lived in fear of being ruled by a king go from republic to having an emperor to emperor worship? Well, Romans did worship leaders, but it was not a widespread practice until the Republic began to expand. An example of this is Titus Quinctius Flaminius, who led the decisive battle of the Second Macedonian War, capturing Greece for Rome in 197 BCE. Further transitional figures between the Republic and the Empire had their own cults like Pompey, Mark Antony, and most importantly to the establishment of the imperial cult, Julius Caesar. Moving on from there, although never an emperor, Julius Caesar was deified by the Senate. After Caesar, emperors were also deified by the Senate upon their deaths. On top of that, the living emperor and his family were also ultimately worshipped. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it was Augustus himself who was the one to solidify emperor worship, walking the tightrope of worshipping an autocratic ruler who is king in all but name with the political power provided by being worshipped as a living god. On the latter, Augustus being worshipped as a god was not something that would look good for his position. Thus, what was worshipped instead was the Numen, or the spiritual power of the emperor. To smooth over the delicate boundary between king and emperor, emperor worship was further first tied to the Roma cult, which worshipped the personification of Rome. Over time, as the concept of emperor set in and became accepted as a permanent fixture of Rome, and the emperors themselves became worshipped rather than the power they possessed or their association with Roma. Over time, as the concept of emperor set in and became accepted as a permanent fixture of Rome, and the emperors themselves became worshipped rather than the power they possessed or their association with Roma. The cults ultimately became integral to state religion. Worshipping the emperor proved Roman loyalty. 
royalty. The rituals, festivals, and celebrations tied the people to the emperor and increased his power. Roman citizens and provincials were allowed to worship other gods as long as the emperor was worshipped as well. This is why we see in native temples in Egypt, Syria, and Mesopotamia statues of the Roman emperors in temples built during Roman times. This would play a large part of why Christians were persecuted as they refused to worship the emperor and thus did not show loyalty to Rome. As noted, while Jews sometimes were forced to reckon with emperor worship, for the most part, they were excused on the grounds that their religion was ancestral, whereas the Christian religion was not. And speaking of Christianity in the second century, mystery religions started taking on a life of their own as well, taking a more individual approach rather than the communal Roman religions. There were initiation ceremonies, purification rituals, and a much smaller group setting. Eastern religions such as Mithraism and the cult of Sol Invictus came from Persia and Syria respectively. Mithraism is particularly interesting because it was a take on the Zoroastrianism of Rome's perennial enemy, Persia. Persia and Rome would be at war and suffer strained relations until the Arab conquest of the Sassanid Empire in 651 CE. Despite this, these religions had a large impact on Roman religion. Mithras was the legendary hero sent by the god of light Ahura Mazda to slay a mythical bull. When Mithras slew the bull, his blood covered the earth and gave rise to the natural world and all living things. Mithras was identified with the sun, which gave it a connection to the other major mystery cults, the cult of Sol Invictus. While Sol had been worshipped in early Rome as a solar deity, often paired with the Greek Apollo or Roman Helios, Sol Invictus was a Syrian solar deity imported to Rome and popularized by the emperor Elagabalus during his reign in 218 to 222 CE. Elagabalus was its priest as a boy and he tried and failed to make Sol Invictus the chief deity of Rome. Later, Aurelian in 274 succeeded where Elagabalus had failed and Sol Invictus became the supreme Roman deity. So what made these cults so different from native Roman cults? Aside from the shifting focus and style of rituals, the practitioners of these cults were henotheistic. That meant that they recognized that other gods existed but worshipped Mithras or Sol Invictus almost exclusively. The worshippers were usually soldiers, merchants, and other elites. The cults were an important step to Christianity's formation as Christianity was influenced by their structure and rituals. Christianity itself was considered a competing mystery cult. Of course, as alluded to, unlike those mystery cults, Christianity would not recognize the existence of gods other than the Christian god and, unsurprisingly, from this forbade the worship of the emperor, who the other mystery cults were always willing to worship. The result of this, as a alluded to was widespread and extremely brutal persecution of Christians for quite some time in the Roman Empire. Moving on from there, going the other way with other cultures absorbing Roman gods, while some foreign gods like Isis, Sibyl, and Sol Invictus made their way to the city of Rome and were adopted by Romans throughout the empire, others stayed local. However, these deities that stayed local often fused with Roman deities, or more aptly it seems to have been a matter of identifying a certain type of god with its native equivalent. Take for example Mars, the Roman god of war. In Britain, there were many gods of war, and they often took the name of Mars for that reason. This is the case with Celtic war gods like Mars Albiorix, who was both a war god and a mountain god, and Mars Candatus, who was both a war god and a river god. The conquered people brought in the Roman gods and fused them with their own so they could fit in with the core of the empire. That said, in most cases, it is unclear if these combinations are separate gods in their own sense, a different god altogether, or an aspect of the foreign or Roman god. In some cases, gods will appear once or a handful of times in sources like inscriptions or with no elaboration. The lack of documentation for a vast majority of these gods leaves us with a lot of questions about their nature and how Romans themselves saw them. In some cases, you'll even find gods that are amalgamations of a Roman god, a foreign god, and an emperor. This is the case with Mars Lucetius Augustus, a combination of Mars, a Celtic thunder god, Lucetius, and the Emperor Augustus. Given how widespread religious worship was, you might be surprised at the lack of hard documentation in many cases. The reason we don't have much information about Roman religions is simply that they were all replaced by one of the most persecuted in Rome, Christianity, which ultimately endured the extreme onslaught and replaced all the old religions over the later periods of Rome. On that note, it is technically fair to call the Christian god a Roman god, as he did indeed become the chief god of Rome. It should also be noted that discourse about the Christian god was bolstered by philosophy, a hallmark of Hellenic civilization. Greek philosophers particularly put forth theories of a supreme deity that sometimes got identified with the Greek gods. Through translation and Greek studies, the Platonists, Stoics, and Epicureans took over philosophical discourse 
discourse in Rome, the philosophers had their own discussion of gods and supreme beings. When Christianity began to overtake the Roman religion, the philosophies moved once again in a different direction. Plotinus, who died in 270 CE, gave Romans a way to talk about their gods philosophically to counter the growing Christian intellectual presence. This philosophy was elaborated on by future Platonists following Plotinus. These philosophers also worked out their own defenses of Roman rituals, theologies of the Olympic gods, and wrote polemics against Christians. At the time, Greek epics such as Homer and Hesiod's poetry became a Roman Bible of sorts, with the philosophers developing a relationship with them similar to the ones their Christian rivals had to the Bible. This literature was only among the elites, so it is unknown how much it filtered into Roman society. But one major consequence of Roman philosophers turning to Greek works by Homer and Hesiod is that the Roman gods became more tied to the Olympian Greek gods. It should also be noted from all of this that we got a lot of our knowledge of Roman religion from the Church Fathers' writings. Since Church Fathers were at an ideological war with philosophers, we thus likely have an exaggerated view of how Greek Roman religion was. In the end, any gods the Romans worshipped became a Roman god. This is true for emperors, foreign gods, and even the Christian gods that eventually replaced all of them. The Olympian gods of the Greeks were not even necessarily the gods of Rome, but they also were, and the situation gets more confusing the more you find out. It was this incredibly flexible system of religion that allowed the Romans to so seamlessly incorporate and be accepting of the countless religions in and around their lands and with the peoples they conquered.